So today, August 23rd, and we're here with Bhante Vimalaramzi, and he will be doing Sutta 91. Uh, what was the name of that again? The Brahmai Sutta. Happy Sunday afternoon. Morning. <laughs> Hope everything is going well for you. David just told me about a, a study he he read on smiling, and it was all scientific. It didn't have anything to do with uh, happy feelings or any of that. It <laughs> stuck a pencil in, in a person's mouth, so it pulled the smile up, and then they measured what was happening in the brain. And... It made everybody feel happy, whether they liked it or not. Didn't matter whether they tried to make you happy. So, guess what I suggest? <laughs> okay. Now, this particular sutta is about the 32 parts of a great man. But there's a lot of practical advice of things that you can try for yourself and see if you can do them. So you'll see. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was wandering in the country of the Vedayans with a large number of Sangha with 500 monks. He didn't go anywhere without 500 monks. Have That, that seems to be a favored number. I, I think it just means that there is a lot of monks following him. Now on that occasion, the Brahman Brahmayu was living at Matilda. He was old, aged, burdened with air, years advanced in life and come to the last stage. He was in his 120th year. He was a master of the three Vedas with their vocabulary, liturgy, phonology, etymology, and histories as the fifth. And he was skilled in philology and grammar. As he was fully versed in natural philosophy and in the marks of a great man. The Brahman Brahmayu heard the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from the Sakyan clan, has been wandering in the country of the Vedayans with a large Sangha of monks. Now, a good report of Master Gotama has been spread to this effect. The Blessed One is accomplished, fully awakened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, awakened and blessed. He declares this world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas. This generation with its recluses and brahmins. With its princes and its people. Which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end with the right meaning and phrasing. He reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Now, it is good to see such arahats. Now, on that occasion, the Brahman Brahmayu had a young Brahman student named Uttara, who has mastered the three Vedas and was fully versed in natural philosophy and in the marks of a great man. He told his student, my dear Uttara, the recluse Gotama, 
the son of the Sakyan, has, who went forth from the Sakyan clan. and has been wandering in the country of the Vedeans with a large sangha of monks with 500 monks. Now it's good to see such arahats. Come, my dear Uttara, go to the recluse Gotama and find out whether the report spread about him is true or not, and whether the master Gotama is one such as this or not. Thus we shall know about Master Gotama through you. But how shall I find out, sir, whether the report spread about Master Gotama is true or not, and whether Master Gotama is one of such as this or not? My dear Uttara, the 32 marks of a great man have been handed down in our hymns, and the great man who is endowed with them has only one of two possi possible destinies, no other. If he lives the holy life, he becomes a wheel-turning monarch a righteous king who rules by the Dhamma, master of the four quarters, all victorious, who has stabilized his country and possesses the seven treasures. He has these seven treasures, the wheel treasure, the elephant treasure, the horse treasure, the jewel treasure, the women treasure, the steward treasure, and the counselor treasure as the seventh. So women can't complain too much because uh, they think the Buddha is dis. Uh, they think that he he doesn't like women so much. It's one of the treasures, so feel good about that. And don't complain to me anymore because you think I'm a, I'm a sexist. I am not, I promise. <laughs> Who exceeds a thousand are brave hero uh, his children who exceed 1,000. He was a busy monarch. Are brave and heroic and crush the armies of others. Over this earth bounded by the ocean, he rules without a rod, without a weapon, by means of Dhamma. But if he goes forth from the home life into homelessness, he becomes an accomplished one, fully awakened who draw, draws aside the veil in the world. But I, my dear Uttaran, am the giver of the hymns. You are the receiver of them. Yes, sir, he replied. He rose from his seat after paying homage to the Brahmin Brahmayu, keeping him on his right he left for the country of the Vedeans, where the Blessed One was wandering. Traveling by stages, he came to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and looked for the 32 marks of a great man. He saw more or less 32 marks of a great man on the Blessed One's body, except two. He was doubtful and uncertain about two, two of the marks. He could not decide and make up his mind about them. One of the things that uh, the Buddha, Buddha, his body, 
his male organ shrank like a like a bull and it it, it was uh, it was sheathed and this is one of the the things about the male organ they're talking about and about the largeness of his tongue the buddha had exceptional powers of taste nobody could ever uh, poison him by giving him things that would be bad for him. And his tongue was really long. I'm not sure what that has to do with taste, but it might. <clears throat> anyway. Then it occurred to the Blessed One, this Brahmin student, Uttara, sees more or less the 32 marks of a great man. Except for two. He's doubtful and uncertain about two of the marks, and he cannot decide and make up his mind about them, about the male or organ being enclosed in a sheath, and about the largeness of the tongue. Then the Blessed One worked such a feat of supernormal power that the Brahmin student Uttara saw that the Blessed One's male organ was enclosed in a sheath. Next, the Blessed One extruded his tongue, and he reportedly touched both ear holes and both nostrils, and he covered the whole of his forehead with his tongue. That's a long tongue, big tongue. Then the Brahmin student Uttara thought, the recluse Gotama is endowed with the 32 marks of a great man. Suppose I were to follow the recluse Gotama and observe his behavior. Then he followed the Blessed One for seven months, like a shadow never leaving him. At the end of seven months in the country of the Vedayans, he set out to journey to Matilda, where the Brahmin Brahmayu was. When he arrived, he paid homage to him and sat down at one side. Thereupon, the Brahmin Brahmayu asked him, Well, my dear Uttara, is the report that has been spread about the Master Gotama true or not true? And is Master Gotama one such as this or not? The report has been spread about Master Gotama is true, sir, not otherwise. The Master Gotama is one such as this, not otherwise. He possesses the 32 marks of a great man. Master Gotama sets his foot down squarely. This is a mark of a, master, a great man. That means he doesn't heel and toe when he's walking. He puts his foot down flat. On the soles of his feet, there are wheels with a thousand spokes and ribs and hubs all complete. This is the, the kind of mark that he made on, in the ground. I was in Utah one time, and I stopped at a dinosaur park and went to the museum. And they had kid shoes that had dinosaur footprints. And I tried to get a, a set of shoes that had dinosaur footprints, but they didn't make them for adults. And I was really disappointed in that. <laughs> so instead, I got a dinosaur for the, for the center. He has protruding heels. 
that means his heels come back behind the tendon that goes up and down the back of the foot. He has long fingers and toes. His hands and feet are soft and tender. He has netted hands and feet, kind of like duck in, in, in between the, the finger. Uh, he had a flesh that went up to the, to the next joint. I guess it would be good for swimming, I'm not sure. His feet are arched naturally. He has legs like an antelope. The, his, his legs were not muscular, but they were fairly long and very strong. When he stands without stooping, the palms of his hands touch and rub against his knees. Now that's, this is where we get into some dispute depending what country you're, you're reading this from. For, for anybody to stand with their shoulders straight and the palm of their hand touches their, their knees, they have exceptionally long arms. So we'll talk about this uh, dispute with in a, in a little while. <coughs> His male organ is sheath is enclosed in a sheath. He is the color of gold. His skin has a golden sheen. He has fine skin and because of the fineness of his skin, dust and dirt do not stick to his body. That would be a convenient thing. His body hairs goes, grows singly, each body hair growing alone in the hair socket. The lips of, the tips of the body hair turn up. The upturned body hairs are blue-black, the color of Corellium curling and turning to the right. He has straight limbs of, he has the straight limbs of a Brahma. He has seven convexities, that's the eyes and ears and, and nose and mouth. His torso is like a lion, that says that his his chest is up and uh, very big. He has a furrow between the shoulders, which fills it in. In, the, in, in your back, between the blades, uh, there's, there's a little bit of a hollow. And this... this the Buddha doesn't have that hollow. He has spread, now here, here we go. He has the spread of a banyan tree. The spread of his arms equals the height of his body, and the height of his body equals the spread of his arms. Now, this was taken from Sri Lankan literature. If the Buddha's arms were so long that they could touch his knees while he was standing straight, he would go out and he would be a foot and a half wider than he is tall. So there's some, some dispute about the translation on this part. 
But according to what this says right here, he uh, was very evenly proportioned with his arms and his legs. His neck and his shoulders are very even, straight across. His taste is supremely acute. Any kind of food, he could tell you what, ver what uh, herbs were in it. He is lion-jawed. His jaw was square. Not, not pointy. He has 40 teeth. Uh, the average person has 32 teeth. So at the top and the bottom of each side, he had an extra two teeth. And when he, they talk about his eating habits, he had, his, he had enough teeth that not even one grain of rice went down his, his throat without being chewed. His teeth are even. His teeth are without gaps. His teeth are quite white. He has a large tongue. He has a divine voice, like the call of Kavar, Karavika, excuse me, bird. There's a bird in Asia, it's a little yellow bird, big voice, really big voice. And every time I would hear this bird, I would stop what I was doing and listen to it. Now, when the Buddha was giving a talk, he never raised his voice. He would have the same volume for everyone, and everyone could hear him equally well, whether you were in the back of the crowd or in the front. So he had a very interesting voice that was very melodious and beautiful to listen to. This is one that surprises a lot of people. The Buddha's eyes were blue. He was a Sakyan. He had eyelashes like, a, like an ox, very long eye, eyelashes. He has hair growing in the space between his eyebrows, which is white with the sheen of soft cotton. Now, that right above my head here, there is a Buddha image that has a dot right there, and everybody says, oh, that's his third eye. Actually, it wasn't his third eye. It was a white hair that when he, when he unfurled it, it was about two feet long. It came back in, in a, a white dot. His head is shaped like a turban. Um, well, I, I don't see any Buddha images in this part that you could see that. He, he he had like a big knot right here. And I don't know from reading the suttas whether this is absolutely true or not. But on the light night of his awakening, his brain grew. Now, the reason that I say that is because when I was doing so much meditation in Burma and I was sitting long periods of time, I, I started growing a knot 
on the top of my head. And people started saying that I'm the next, going to be the next Buddha, which is doubtful, but not just doubtful, highly doubtful. So that's one of the reasons that I started saying that. And lately there's been a lot of study on people that practice gratitude. And the more you practice gratitude, your brain, your brain starts to grow and it, you, you start to have a little, uh, not weird looking bumps, but just bigger bumps on your head than you had before. So I'm thinking that if you smile more, that's going to make your brain bigger. So we'll have to wait and see after a few years whether that really happens. So everybody from here on out, all your waking time, walk around with a pencil in your mouth. And we'll, we'll see how, how, how the brain grows. <laughs> Yeah, this this is a, a good exercise, and it, it's going to make you happy. And people are going to look at you and go, "Are you crazy, walking around with a pencil in your mouth?" Master Gotama is endowed with the thirty-two marks of a great man. When he walks, now this is one of the things that I, I've tried doing for quite a while, and it's a difficult practice. When he walks, he steps out with his right foot first. Try that. Every time you get up, always start on your right foot. If you started on your left foot, go back to where you were and then start on the right foot. Get in the habit of doing that. It's not an easy practice, but it is interesting. He does not extend his foot too far or put it too near. So he walks at a normal kind of pace. He walks neither too quickly nor too slowly. He walks without his knees knocking together. I love that one. I've never seen anybody that had knock knees. I've heard about it, but I've never seen it. He walks without his ankles knocking together. He walks without raising and lowering his thighs. Or bringing his thighs together or keeping them apart. When he walks, only the lower part of his body oscillates. And he does not walk with a lot of bodily effort in a relaxed, comfortable pace. When he turns to look, he does so with his whole body. He does not look straight up. He does not look straight down. Now, when, when somebody would come and say something to him and he wanted to stop and talk to them, he would just turn his whole body around. He, he didn't look over his shoulders. That's what it's really saying. And he didn't never tilted his head so that he was looking all the way up or his chin, chin on, his, on his chest looking down. He does not walk looking about. Okay, it, it says, I think this is in Abhidhamma, but it might be suttas too, that he walked a plow's length, looking a plow's length ahead of him, which is depending on what kind of animal it is. It can be eight feet, nine feet, or even a little bit closer, maybe seven feet. It 
So he always, he walks about that with looking, looking ahead. And he doesn't have hindrances pulling his attention away. Now, this is one of the, the big things about a Buddha. It, he, get, he would get attacked by hindrances at different times, but his mindfulness was so sharp that he would see it and then he would use the right effort or the six R's and let go of it. When he goes indoors, he does not raise or lower his body or bend it forward or back. Now there, there's some talk about the actual size of the Buddha. Some people said that he was 13 feet tall. In Burma, they have statues that are 24 feet tall. But I think he was a tall man, especially for that area. I know what it's like because I'm tall and I've been to that area. But I think he was about two meters tall. Now, if you're two meters tall, a lot of the doorways are six feet. And two meters is six feet eight. And it was mostly in Thailand, I noticed this. When I go through a doorway, I would see that the door is low and I duck my head like that and then I'd hit myself right across the head. And I, I constantly had scabs on my head because of that. Uh, been forward and been. He turns around neither too far from the seat nor too near. So he's very careful about the distance he needs to have space for sitting. He does not, not lean on the seat with his hands. He does not throw his body onto the seat. He sits properly. He sits um, in a harmonious way. When seated indoors, he does not fidget with his hands. He does not fidget with his feet. He does not sit with his knees crossed. I've been criticized because I tell people don't cross your legs when you're listening to a Dhamma talk. Do not sit with the ankles crossed. Now this has to do with body language. When you get, you get a book about body language, it tells you what's happening in your mind when you sit with your ankles crossed or your knees crossed. And it has to do with your attention at that time. It's uh, your attention span is easily distracted and you have a tendency to have a lot of extracurricular uh, wandering mind. He does not sit with his hands holding his chin. What's in your mind when you're like that? Your mind is dull, it's not very alert. When seated indoors, he is not afraid. He does not shiver or tremble. He is never nervous. Being unafraid, not shivering or trembling or nervous, <coughs> His hair does not stand on end, and his intent is on seclusion. When fear arises, 
uh, I've had it happen, and I suppose other people have too. The hair on your back of your neck, the hair on your arms will stand up straight. Now, the thing with fear is it has a tendency to really get you caught in your mind, in the kind of thoughts you have, and involvement in trying to control that unpleasant mental state and physical state. There's a couple of things you can do, and that is one, you can ask your intuition, what is the cause of this fear? And you will see the cause, and it'll be very easy to let it go. Another thing you can do with fear is laugh with it. The more you laugh, the more balance comes into your mind the better your mindfulness is at that time. Now, when I give a retreat, I tell, I tell everybody at the start of the retreat, I want you to smile all the time. When it's difficult to smile, I want you to laugh. And I want you to have fun on the retreat. Now, if you follow the, those simple directions, instructions, uh, you, you will be successful with your meditation. So try to keep that in mind, especially if, if you get in a situation where there is fear coming up. You laugh with it. You use the six R's, allow it to be there. It's not yours. You didn't ask that fear to come up. You don't need to control it. You don't need to be nervous about anything. What is fear? What is nervousness? It is a version to what you are experiencing in the present. So using the six R's and developing your sense of humor with it, that will disappear very quickly. When he receives water for the bowl, he does not raise or lower the bowl or tip it forwards or backwards. When, when you have an alms bowl, you put it out straight. You don't Tip it so somebody else can see inside. He passes, he, he receives neither too little nor too much water in the bowl. Now, during the time of the Buddha, they didn't have a lot of sinks around. They didn't have a lot of washing devices around. So every time before a monk ate, they would wash the bowl out, or before they went out for alms round, they would wash the bowl very well. He washes a bowl without making splashing noises. This is not easy. But when you wash the bowl, you want to make sure you wash it very completely <coughs> During the time of the Buddha, they did not eat with utensils. They ate with their hands. So when they started putting water in the bowl and started washing the bowl, they were washing their hands at the same time. He washes the bowl without turning it around. I've been with a lot of monks that they... They take their bowl and they're, they're twisting it around so that they're uh, able to clean it that way. And his hands get washed. 
He pours the water out of the bowl neither too far nor too near, and he does not pour it about. It still has food in it, so you don't pour it about. Generally, what happens when you're, when you're using a bowl and you're, you're following the rules closely is someone will come with a, a trash bowl so you can dump it all in, make sure there's no food stuck to the sides and that sort of thing. They use a coconut hull if the food ha is is uh, greasy. Then this will help take some of that out. When he receives rice, he does not raise or lower the bowl or tip it forwards or backwards. I've always found when, when I was on alms round, it was depended on whether a child was giving, putting food in the bowl or it was an adult. I would bend down so that a child could see where to put the food. He receives neither too little rice nor too much rice. He adds sauces in the right proportion and he does not exceed the right amount of sauce in a mouthful. Now, it's an interesting thing. One of the eating rules for monks, there, there's a bunch of them. Like uh, if I'm eating something and I look into another person's bowl to see what they're eating, that's an offense. Uh, if, if it causes any kind of thing to, any lust to arise in your mind, that's an offense. If you're taking your rice and the rice that you put in your mouth is bigger than a peacock egg, which is about that big, or it makes your cheeks come out, that is an offense. The proper amount of rice, the Buddha said, is the size of a medium chicken egg, which is well, about that. <coughs> But even that's too much for me. I never did like that. Uh, I, I never did think that was a good rule because that was too much. It made my cheeks bulge out when I would eat, eat the rice like that. Okay, he turns a mouthful of rice over two or three times in his mouth and then swallows it and no rice kernel enters his body unchewed, and no rice kernel remains in his mouth. Then he takes another mouthful. He takes his food experiencing the taste, though not experience the greed for the taste. One of the things that happens once you start getting deeper into your meditation is you start developing disenchantment for taste. You might have favorite foods that, that are on the table. Always before when you saw the favorite foods, your mouth would start to water and you'd start thinking about how good it's going to taste because you like it. But as you get more and more equanimity in your mind, you start developing disenchantment. In Asia, the favorite thing of all the people that I met, the, the most uh, 
pleasant thing anybody can do is eat their favorite food. And they really like it a lot. And that's fine, I mean. But once you start getting disenchanted, that's one of the questions that we ask folks. Uh, is, a is a tooth, excuse me, is the food that you're putting in your mouth, that does it make your mind excited? And when people are really progressing, the answer is, yes, it looks like my favorite food, but I don't get excited about it. It's just food. It's something that I have to keep in my stomach so I can continue on with the path. That's the kind of answers I get from that. <clears throat> The food he takes has eight factors. It is neither for amusement, nor for intoxication, nor for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness, but only for the endurance and continuance of the body, for the ending of discomfort, being hungry, and assisting in the holy life, he considers, I shall terminate old feelings without arousing new feelings, and I shall be healthy and blameless and shall live in comfort. Now the thing with, with monks is we don't eat an evening meal. And depending on the discipline of the monks. There are some monks that eat breakfast. There are some monks that don't. I personally don't eat breakfast. I don't want breakfast. I just eat one time a day. And you have a tendency to be more healthy if you eat like that. Now, I hear all kinds of things about breakfast being the most important part of the uh, meal of the day and such. But uh, I'm healthier than most people. I don't get, I, I had a cold two, two years ago. I think it was two years ago. And the cold lasted for almost eight hours before it went away. When I start to feel a cold coming on, I stop eating completely. The only thing I do is take vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin B3, and rest. Now, almost all laymen, especially if they're working for a living, they feel a cold coming on. Now, what does a cold coming on feel like? Oh, you feel kind of achy in your, in your joints and you feel a little stiff and you're starting to sniffle and sneeze more. Now, you have about a two hour window to act so you won't get caught by that cold. If you act this way, if you stop eating and take your vitamins and minerals and lay down and rest, sleep, and when I say lay down and rest, that doesn't mean watching TV, it doesn't mean reading a book, it doesn't mean listening to music. It means rest. Now I've had this happen so many times in my life, I feel like I'm an expert on it. But whatever kind of cold that I would, I would normally get, it doesn't last long. 
Now, if you got a cold and you start feeling achy and then you tell yourself, well, I got to go to work today even though I don't feel like it, well, that cold is going to last 10 days or two weeks. That's just the way it is. But if you first start to notice that it's time to stop eating, just take vitamins and minerals and lay down and rest, at the most you're going to lose one day's, one day's work. At the most. So I highly recommend doing this with this kind of uh, discipline. Lucille Ananda was going and getting a, a doctor's checkup about every two months. And he'd go to the doctor and the, the doctor asked him about his eating habits. Lucille Ananda liked to eat breakfast, so he ate breakfast, then he ate lunch, and after that he didn't eat for the rest of the day. And the doctor that he went to, he was very enthusiastic about fasting. So Lucille Ananda told him, I fast for 16 hours a day. And the doctor was real impressed by that. One of the things that I have found out that's quite interesting is in, if you get hungry in the middle of the day, instead of looking for t something to munch on, some kind of food, take water. Warm water, a little bit of salt in it. And it'll take your, your munchies away. So it's a real interesting thing if you do that. The food he takes has eight factors. Oh, I just read that. When he has eaten and received water for the bowl, he does not raise or lower the bowl or fill it, tip it forwards or backwards. He receives neither too little nor too much water for the bowl. He washes the bowl without making splashing noise. He washes the bowl without turning it around. He does not put the bowl on the floor to wash with his hands. When his hands are washed, the bowl is washed. When the hands are washed, or when the bowl is washed, his hands are washed. He pours the water from the bowl either into or too far or too near from where he is. When he is eaten, he puts the bowl on the floor, neither too far nor too near. And he is neither careless with the bowl nor over solicitous with the bowl. Now, during the time of the Buddha, they didn't have a lot of materials to make bowls. So they made clay bowls. And if you have a clay bowl, you have to take very good care of it because it'll crack and then you have to make another one. <coughs> when I first became a monk, I had a clay bowl for about six months. And the thing with a clay bowl is the the bottom of the bowl is fairly thick. And that made the bowl heavy to carry. 
So we didn't have, well, you see now a lot of the Thai monks in particular, they have these bowls that are really big. But if that was made out of clay, it'd be so heavy they couldn't carry any food in it. So we, have to, we had to be careful of that sort of thing. When he has eaten, he sits in silence for a while. Almost everybody, especially laymen, when they get done eating, they get up and start moving around. And that's not good. You need to sit with the food and let it settle in your stomach. After 10 minutes or 15 minutes, then get up and start moving around. You'll see that your digestion is so much better. And it really does make sense to do it that way. But he does not let the time for the blessing go by. Some, some monks, they give a blessing at the beginning of the meal, some of them give it at the end, some of them give it both. When he is eaten and given the blessing, he does not so do so criticizing the meal or expecting another meal. He instructs, urges, rouses, and encourages that audience with a talk purely on the Dhamma. When he has done so, he raises from his seat and departs. He walks neither too fast nor too slow. And he does not go as one who wants to get away. His robe is worn neither too high nor too low on his body, nor too tight against his body, nor too loose against his body, nor does the wind blow the robe away from his body. Dust and dirt do not soil his body. When he is gone to a monastery, he sits down in a seat made ready. Having sat down, he washes his feet though he is, does not concern himself with grooming his feet. Having washed his feet, he seats himself cross-legged, sets his body erect and establishes mindfulness in front of him. Again, this is from Sri Lankan translation. And almost all Asians, although they spend time sitting on the floor, uh, I found that an awful lot of people need to sit in a chair instead of sit on the floor because of the pain of not being used to sitting on a chair or on a floor. Sitting in a chair in a comfortable way without pushing your back against the chair is a very helpful thing. It doesn't cause pain to arise. Your mind has a tendency to get more peaceful and quiet. So, he does not occupy his mind with self-affliction or the affliction of others or the affliction of both. He sits with his mind set on his own welfare, on the welfare of others, on the welfare of both, even on the welfare of the whole world. When he's gone for, to the monastery, he teaches the Dhamma to an audience. He neither flatters nor betrays that audience. He instructs, urges, rouses, and encourages it with a talk purely on the Dhamma. There are uh, some monks today that are more bound towards 
entertaining people than they are teaching actual Dhamma. And this is highly un, not recognized as a good way to teach. It is criticized. The speech that issues from his mouth has eight qualities. It is distinct, intellectual, melodious, audible, ringing, and euphorous, deep and sonorous. But while his voice is intelligible as far as the audience extends, his voice does not issue out beyond the audience. When, when the people have been instructed, urged, roused, and encouraged by them, they rise from their seats and depart, looking only at him, concerned with nothing else. We have seen Master Gotama walking, sir. We have seen him standing. We have seen him entering in, indoor rooms. We have seen him indoors seated in a silence after eating. We have seen him giving the blessing and eating. We have seen them. We have seen him going to the monastery in silence. We have seen him in the monastery teaching the Dhamma to an audience. such as the Master Gotama, and such as he, and, the, and more than that. When we have seen this, the Master Brahman uh, Brumayu rose from his seat after arranging his upper roll on one shoulder. He extended his hands in reverential salutation towards the Blessed One and uttered this exclamation three times. Honored to the Blessed One, the accomplished and fully awakened one. Honored to the Blessed One, accomplished and fully awakened. Honored to the Blessed One, accomplished and fully awakened. Perhaps sometime or other we might meet Master Gotama, or perhaps we might meet with one of with some conversation with him. Then, in the course of his wandering, the Blessed One eventually arrived at Matilda. There the Blessed One lived in uh, Mahadeva's mango grove. grove. The Brahmin householders of Matilda heard the recluse Gotama, son of the Sakyans, who went forth from a, a, a Sakyan clan, has been wandering in the country of the Vidayans with a large Sangha of monks. And he now he has now come to Matilda and is living in Mahadeva's mango grove. Now a good report of Master Gotama has been spread to this effect. It is good to see such arahats. Then the Brahmin householder of Matilda went to the Blessed One. Some paid homage to the Blessed One. Some paid homage to the Blessed One and sat down. Some <clears throat> exchange greetings with him. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, sat down. Some extended their hands in reverential salutation towards him and sat down at one side. Some pronounced the name of their 
clan in the blessed one's presence and sat down at one side. Some kept silent and sat down at one side. Then the Brahmin Brahmayu heard the recluse Gotama, son of the Sakyans, who went forth from the Sakyan clan, has arrived in Matilda and is living in, at Mahadeva's mango grove in Matilda. <clears throat> then the Brahmin Brahmayu went to the Mahadeva's mango grove with a number of Brahmin students. When he came to the mango grove, he thought, it is not proper that I should go to the recluse Gotama without first being announced. Then he addressed a certain monk, come Brahmin, go to the recluse Gotama and ask in my name whether the recluse Gotama is free from illness and affliction and is healthy strong and abiding in comfort, saying, Master Gotama, the Brahmin Brahma, you ask whether recluse, ask whether Master Gotama is free from illness and abiding in comfort, and say this, the Brahmin Brahma, you, Master Gotama is old, aged, burdened with years, advanced in life, come to the last stage. He is in his 120th year. Uh, Venerable Ananda lived to be 120 years old. It seems that, that that seemed to be like kind of like the average age of people dying during the time of the Buddha. <clears throat> Not that you, they didn't have people dying before that, but that seemed to be a common age for people to die. He is a master of the three Vedas with the vocabularies, liturgy, phonology, etymology, the histories as the fifth, skill in philology and grammar. And grammar. He is fully versed in Uh, the natural philosophy and in the marks of a good man, a great man. Of all the Brahmin householders who live in Matilda, the Brahmin Brahmayu is pronounced the foremost of them in wealth, in knowledge of the hymns, and in age and fame. He wants to see Master Gotama. Yes, sir, the Brahmin student replied, went to the Blessed One, exchanged greetings with him. He went with this courteous and amiable talk, was finished. He stood at one side and delivered the message. The Blessed One said, now is the time for the Brahmin Brahmayu to do as he thinks fit. When the Brahmin student went back to the Brahmin Brahmayu and he said, Permission has been granted by the recluse Gotama. Now is the time to do as you think fit. So the Brahman Brahmayu went to the Blessed One. The assembly saw him coming in the, in the distance and they at once made way for him. For he was a well-known and famous person. Then the Brahman Brahmayu said to the assembly, Enough! Let each sit down on his own seat. I shall sit here next to the recluse Gotama. Then he went to the Blessed One, exchanged greetings, and when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side. He looked for the 32 marks of a great man. He saw more or less the 30 marks of a great man on the Blessed One's body, except for two. He was doubtful about the two marks. He could not decide or make up his mind about the male organ being enclosed in a sheath. 
and about the largeness of the tongue. When the Brahmin Brahmayu addressed the Blessed One in stanza, <coughs> the two and thirty marks I've learned that are the sign of a great man. I still not see two of these upon your body, Gotama. What should be concealed by cloth, hid by sheath, greatest of men, though called by word and of feminine gender, perhaps your tongue is a manly one. Perhaps your tongue is large as well, according to what we have taught. Please put it out a bit. And so, see her cure our doubt for welfare in this is very in this very life and happiness and lives to come. And now we crave to ask leave something that we aspire to know. Then it occurred to the Blessed One, this Brahman Brahmayu sees and sees more or less the thirty two marks of a great man except for two that was doubtful and uncertain about two of the marks. And he, he cannot decide and make up his mind about that, about the male organ being uh, enclosed in a sheath and about the largeness of the tongue. Then the Blessed One worked such a feat of supernormal power that the Brahman Brahmayu saw that the Blessed One's male organ was enclosed in a sheath. Next, the Blessed One extruded his tongue and he re repeatedly touched both ear holes and nostrils. He covered the whole of his forehead with his tongue. Then the Blessed One spoke the stanza and returned to the Brahman Brahmayu. Thirty and two marks you have learned that are the signs of a great man. All of my body can be found. So Brahman, doubt no more on that. What must be known is directly known. What must be developed has been developed. What must be abandoned has been abandoned. Therefore, Brahman, I am a Buddha. For the welfare in this very life and, and happiness in lives to come, set, uh, since leave is given you, Please ask whatever you aspire to know. Then the Brahman Brahmayu thought, Permission has been granted me by the recluse Gotama. Which should I ask him about? Good in this life or good in the lives to come? Then he had thoughts. I am skilled in the good of this life and others too ask me about the good in this life. Why shouldn't I ask him only about the good in the lives to come? Then, the, then he addressed the Blessed One in stanza. How does one become a Brahmin? And how far does one attack to not attain that knowledge. How has one uh, won the triple knowledge? And how does one become a holy scholar? How does one become an arahat? And how does one attain completeness? How is one a silent sage? And how does it come to be 
to be called a Buddha. Then the Blessed One spoke this stanza in reply. One who knows about his former lives sees heaven and states of deprivation and has arrived at birth's destruction. A sage who knows by direct knowledge, who knows his mind is purified. entirely freed from every lust. When he has abandoned birth and death, who is complete in the holy life? Who has transcended everything? One such as this is called a Buddha. When this was said, the Brahman Brahmayu rose from his seat after arranging his upper robe on one shoulder, he prostrated himself with his head at the Blessed One's feet. And he covered the Blessed One's feet with... So what happens is Brahmayu leaves the Buddha he goes back and he starts practicing the meditation that the Buddha taught him. And in a short period of time, like a couple of weeks, Brahmayu died. And he died as not an arahat, he died as a sotapanna. And the Buddha became very famous because everybody heard that Brahmayu still had more to learn and learned it from the, the Buddha. So I've been talking for a real long time. Do you have any questions? This particular sutta is good fun because you get to learn about what the Buddha was talking about when he, they talk about the 32 parts of a, of a great man. I have met some monks that have marks of a great man, but they don't have all of them. So, do you have any question? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask What's happening? I can't have yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, you want to go, Philip? Uh, you can go, Philip. After the, after you. Okay. okay. Uh, Bante, um, my first. It is kind of a request. The first thing, first one. I didn't see any uh, video discourse on. Seven factors of enlightenment. Uh, it is just a request. Uh, can you please give some discourse on that in near future? Okay, I'll try it for the next week. Thank you. And uh, second thing, uh, last last week you you asked me to sit for two hours. Yes. Um, Actually, I was uh, every time I was sitting, I determined to sit for two hours, and I was able to sit comfortably. I can say, uh, but I am ending five five minutes before or ten minutes before the sitting. Then close your eyes and continue until you're done. Uh, do you recommend to keep some alarm or no? You open your eyes, you see you have 10 minutes to go, don't break your sitting, close your eyes oh. and continue. Okay, I thought I should not open my eyes. Okay. Well, but you do because you want to see if it's time. Okay. No problem with that. You're not breaking your sitting when you open your eyes and see you have another 10 minutes, then just continue on. Okay, I thought, uh, okay, I thought otherwise. Um, I don't have any other question. Okay. 
Thank you, Bhante. Did you have good sitting? Was your mindfulness strong? Yeah, it's uh, I, I can able to be an object of meditation for 10 to 15 minutes. And what's your object of meditation? Uh, quiet mind with uh, equanimity or tranquility. Okay, you need uh, let go of the tranquility, let go of the equanimity, you need to sharpen your mindfulness because it's not as keen as it needs to be. You need to see the very, very beginning of any slight movement of mind's attention. Okay. okay. And you want to relax and then just let it be by itself. Okay. Good. Sounds like you're doing good. Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Anybody else? I had a question. Okay. I'm curious about, uh, it said there was a blessing that they would give after the meal or before right. the meal? I was it's, a, it's a chanting. Okay. <coughs> Depending on what country you're in, if you're in Malaysia, they do a chanting at the beginning, they do a chanting at the end, and then there's a short Dhamma talk. What does the chanting do? Does it have some effect? Kind of what's it for, I'm wondering. Well, it's repeating some of, this, some of the things that the Buddha said. That's what suttas are. Okay. Okay. It helps keep your mind more peaceful and calm, more accepting. Okay. Now, when, when you're talking about meditation, it's not only about sitting. I want to get rid of that false idea. Meditation has three parts to it. The first part is practicing your generosity. The more you smile and give your smile to other people, the more you help other people to be happy, you are doing the meditation. And that helps your mind to be more settled. The second part is keeping precepts without breaking them. This is real important. That the closer you can keep your precepts, the better the pra your practice becomes. Your mind becomes quiet. You have less and less disturbances arising in your mind. The last part of meditation is the mental development. The sitting and watching with strong mindfulness, how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Abante? Yes? Uh, thank you for your reading, your talk today. Um, I had never thought of this before, but I have, I am familiar with archaeology and uh -huh. a lot of research about very tall uh, skeletons that have been um, uh, dug up across the United States and different parts of the world and sent to the Smithsonian where they were hidden, many destroyed. And this almost sounds to me as though the, these people are referred to as giants and they can be anywhere from seven to eight feet tall to 25 feet tall. Yeah. And it almost <laughs> remind, makes me think, was, was the Buddha perhaps genetically different from us? No. There... He was tall like I'm tall for this culture. Right, I'm six feet five. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about a not human being. 
You're talking about a different race. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Catalina Island, just off of uh, Los Angeles. Yes. In the 1940s, they dug up 4,000 giants like that. Yes. And they wound up taking all of them and throwing them back in the ocean because they didn't want people to know about having that kind of extraordinary being that was here. So you feel that this would not apply to the Buddha? No. Thank you. Uh, when, when monks become monks, there are certain things that we have to verify. One of the rules of being a monk is we are asked if we are a real human being. And we have to answer honestly about this kind of thing. It, it always has been kind of a peculiar thing that we would be asked that. But there, there are other beings around. I have had some people come to Dhamma talk and they had no white in their eye. Their eye was completely black. Mm -hmm. And I would talk to them at the end of a Dhamma talk and just more chit chat than anything. Uh, and I suspect very highly that it was, they were not human beings by talking with them. Mm -hmm. But who would have asked the Buddha if he was a human being? Nobody. He was a human being. Is this written in his suttas that he states that he was a human being? I'm, I don't mean to be... I'm just trying to share my questions that are rising. Pardon me? I, you're, you're real loud right now. I'm sorry. Okay. There, there were beings that were shapeshifters. They were called reptilians. They looked like human beings when they were awake but when they slept, they went back to their, their nat natural form, which was not human. And the Buddha told them that they had to disrobe because their mind worked different than ours did. And that hey. is in Navinia. That is in Navinia. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh -huh. Bonte. Okay. Anybody else? Hi there. Oh, hello. Oh, go ahead. Hello. 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 A question? Oh, hi. Hi, Bonte. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. Yeah, I've got a request. Okay, what is it? Um, yeah, the request just about Meta. Um, I was wondering, is there any chance at some point talk about the benefits of Meta, please? Are there talk? Boy, I talk about the, <laughs> the advantages of Meta a lot. There's there's many many discourses on the YouTube about the advantages of Meta. Yeah. Uh, one of the real advantages and the reason that I teach metta is because you progress with loving kindness meditation faster than with any other meditation that's being taught. So your progress is very fast. your face becomes radiant, your mind becomes uplifted. 
uh, you sleep more soundly. You sleep more at ease without waking up in the middle of the night. Those are a lot of some of the advantages of doing the loving kindness. Animals like you. Devas like to be yeah. around you. Every time I give a Dhamma talk, there are a lot of devas in, in the room that I'm in. <clears throat> okay? What you've given today, which I've really I, I've I'm really got of alcohol. I'm having trouble understanding you. There's something that's not so good. Try again. Me too. Uh, yeah, uh, the talk today. Enjoy. Uh, I've noticed. Turn, turn, turn your video off and see if that helps. Is that better? Is that yes, okay? Much. Yes, now I can understand Great. you. Right, thank you. Yeah, on the on the subject today, I had a t I had a question in mind, and I've, it's more of an observation. Uh, I've noticed I've gone off alcohol since I've been Good. practicing. Good for you. I can generally tell yeah. people that do a lot of alcohol when they want to do meditation because their mind gets dull very fast. And that's one of the disadvantages sure. of doing the alcohol. Yes. It causes, it causes hindrances to arise. So it's best to stay away from that as much as you can. I've noticed in the pit of my stomach, this the thought of alcohol, even a bad food sometimes makes you feel a bit sicky. It's a bit like, mm, yeah. don't want that. Right. But since I've been practicing, bring, it's been odd. Yeah, I understand. The best drink in the whole world, bar none, is water. Yeah. Affirmative. I, I, I drink between five and ten gallons of water a week. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And I, wow. I'm, I'm healthy. I really am. I'm, I am healthy except for my my feet and legs that got messed up when I did the wrong kind of meditation for a long period of time. Right. Yeah. Great. Hey, thank you very much. Okay. You have Cheers, a Pastor. good week. And you. Thanks. <laughs> Perfect. Anybody else? Hi, Bhante. Hello. Uh, so I have uh, two questions today. Can you okay. hear me right? Yes. Uh, so my first question is actually a follow-up on the previous question. Um, uh, someone was talking about using the, the, uh, the, the timer. Do you recommend against using a timer or a, an alarm during me sitting? Absolutely. And why? 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 Because you get too, too used to sitting for a certain period of time. The way that I teach the meditation, I tell you when you first come, you sit no less than 30 minutes. When your sitting is good, you extend the sitting. You might extend to 45 minutes. You might extend to an hour. You might extend to two hours. If you set a timer, that means that you're just going to stop whenever that timer goes off. And you wind up not gaining the advantage of the meditation in a natural way. Mm, okay. So what... what qualifies as a good meditation in that way well you're quiet your mind is uplifted you have joy or happiness whatever you're going through 
Your mind can be more quiet for a period of time. There are times that you can sit for four hours and it feels like it's 20 minutes. And if you set the alarm at two hours, that would take away from being able to have that experience. Mm. Of course, there's the other way too. You can sit for 20 minutes and it can feel like four hours. But what you want to do is sit as long as you're comfortable and keep your practice going for as long as you can. Mm -hmm. Now I understand being a layman that you have time constraints on the amount of time that you can sit. But there are times, maybe during a weekend, you don't want to get caught just sitting for the amount of time that the timer says. Mm -hmm. You want to extend. Okay? Okay. Great, thank you. And your other, your other question? Uh, yeah, so my other question is, is about the, uh, the all-important six R's. Um, <laughs> so how do, you, how do you know when to go from one to the next? Like how do you know when one R is complete and to, to go on to the next? No, 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 no. You, you're, you're acting like you say each one of those things as you're supposed to be doing it. This happens fast. They roll from one end to the next. So you roll your R's. Release, relax, re-smile, return, whatever. Okay? So you roll one, one R into the next very, very quickly. It shouldn't take you more than three seconds to start with. And then it gets fast after that, when you get more used to it. Okay. So, so... Now, if, if, now let, let me continue on just a bit. Sure. If sure. your mind still has tightness in it, you don't stop and release, relax, release, relax, release, relax. You don't do that. One time. Go through all six R's. If there's still tightness, your mind will go back to that distraction, do it again. Mm -hmm. It will go away eventually. Okay? So, so it's not necessary to let go of all the tension completely in one cycle. You just, no. you just no. go through it and, and whatever releases, releases, and then it comes back. Right. Again. And, and if there's still tension, then come back to it with another six R's. That's mm -hmm. fine. <coughs> okay. Great, thank you, Bonte. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a question? Hi, Bonte. Um, hey. I have a question. Um, so, oh, good. about the uh, the great man and the the significance of the sutra, does it mean that the next arahat should have those 32 signs? And what is no. the significance of that? It's what a Buddha has. He's a great man. So the next arahat doesn't need to have those 32 signs? No, they won't have all 32 marks of a great man. I mean, what if you're a regular human being and you have 32 teeth, you think when you become an arahat, it's going to grow to 30 or to 40? Mm. <laughs> or your arms are real short and then all of a sudden you're supposed to be able to stand and touch your palms, palms with your, to your knees? No, they're just marks that are recognized of somebody that is exceptionally pure. Okay.
Anybody else have a question? I have another question that just came up. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so I mean, when you're sitting, you're not supposed to move. You're supposed to sit still. But I mean, right. what if you you found that you're slouching and then you have to kind of right? you can straighten. Okay. But don't do it. Don't do it over much. If you start slouching, that means you're starting to get into your sloth and torpor a bit. Hmm. So what you want to do is sit a little bit straighter than is comfortable. And then when the sloth and torpor starts to come, you'll start to see more easily the slouching begin. And you can let go more quickly and eventually the sloth and torpor goes away more easily. Okay. So, well, I mean, once you've adjusted, once you've straightened back up, then do you, then you, you let, you let go of your attention to your posture and then just go back to the, the meditation? Your object of meditation. Okay, so you don't need to be overly concerned with sitting up straight unless you find that you don't you're not need to over. No, you, you'll wind up with a headache if you start doing that. Doesn't work very good. Come back to your object of meditation. Always come back. And while you're at it, throw some smiles in there, okay? The biggest problem I have with new students that have been practicing different kinds of meditation is trying to get them to stop being so serious with the practice. Now, I did Burmese style of meditation for about 20 years. And whenever I would go into a retreat where there was quite a few people, I never saw anybody smile. Everybody was doing this, having, having the deep, deep frowns in their head. And they needed to stop pushing and stop trying to control things. So, have fun with the meditation. Don't try to control anything. That's not your job. Your job is simply to observe and allow it to be there by itself and laugh and have fun. Now, this is all the time. This is an all the time practice. Now, is there anybody else with a question? Um, one thing. Um, when, yes. I have another question. This is for uh, my. This is for like. I want your advice for moms who have kids and they are practicing swim for just half an hour a day. What What you advise for them to progress in the dhamma? Extend, extend the time that they're sitting and make sure they use the six hours. If they do that, they will progress very fast. Okay. Mm. Okay, Bhante. Uh, I got the answer. Okay. We've almost been here two hours. You can put the uh, uh, yes. Can I ask uh, one more question? Okay. In the talk, you said that the Buddha would sometimes get attacked by hindrances, but he would use uh, right effort and they would go away. 
Is that right? Well, it, it, yes, it, it depends. There, see, a hindrance is caused from breaking a precept. Okay. The Buddha, although he was a very, very pure being, he didn't have trouble with hindrances for the most part, but there was always Mara slipping around trying to cause problems, trying to cause hindrances to arise. The Buddha's mindfulness was such that he never really got caught by it. He would always see it, and then he would use right effort, which is the six R's, and he would get rid of it. Uh, right before the Buddha died, he had a lot of back pain. And that's because of something he did in one of his million lifetimes before. He was a wrestler and he used to break people's back. He would slam them on his leg and they would break their back. And he, the karma he got from doing that was in his last lifetime, he had very strong back pain. Now, it didn't affect his mind, but it did cause physical problems. So he had to take rest every now and then. Okay. Okay. Okay? Thank you. You want to share some merit now? You got it? Oh, yes, sir. I got it. Okay. Now we're going to share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. You all have a good fun week. Remember to make other people happy. Thank you, Bonte. Thank you, Bonte. Thank you, Bonte. Okay. Thank you, Bonte.